Hi, I'm Zach Waters, and welcome to another episode of What the F Stop Photo Talk, where I chat to photographers about their life and connection to the world through photography. Today's guest, British editorial and documentary photographer Patrick Ward, is somebody I'd been chasing for a while to have a chat with. I really wanted to find out about his connection to the world and his life through photography. What really impresses me about Patrick is his enthusiasm and his drive to still continue to take pictures to this day. He's been a photographer for over 60 years, and that's some mean feat. I was really happy when he agreed to have a chat with me. So we talked about a lot of things and we talked about in particular his time as an inverted commas assistant with John Chillingworth, who was renowned picture post photographer. I mean, he had a full time accountant, for example, who yeah. just sat in another room doing his books, which when, you, when I think that I see an accountant for half an hour each year, I, I've never quite worked out how he structured his working life. But as I say, he was very good to me. He was very generous. He then we chatted a little bit about all these friends that inspire him. In my 20s, I had a group of real friends. I mean, David Hearn, Ian Berry, Philip Jones Griffiths, Don McCullen. So one was surrounded by people who were very fired up. And then when we were talking about Architectural Review's man plan in the 60s, I sort of had to tell him how good he was. And so many of my visits were so fleeting. I mean... I went to the Gorbals, for example, and I was actually there for about four hours with a minder. And out of that, you know, I have eight pictures, which are probably amongst the best pictures that I've shot. Yeah, so, that makes a great uh, photographer. That proves how good you are. That's what photography can be like in the working context. You do have fleeting visits, but it's what you get when you're there. Anyway, the day came. I had a chance to chat to him. And I jumped straight in. You were a very prolific magazine photographer, but I always saw you as a bit of a street photographer, an early street photographer as well, if you don't mind that title. Not at all. I think to a large extent that would encompass all of my best work, would be where I've been out on the street photographing people enjoying themselves, people celebrating, people basically having fun and letting me be a bystander with them. Yeah, I've always looked at your work like that, and especially the period when you were really prolifically doing that. I mean, you have done that. You did do that prolifically for the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, and we'll go into that later. But I think a lot of talk about Tony Ray Jones in the 70s and coming back from America and documenting the British way of life in leisure time. With all respect to Tony Ray Jones, who was a marvel of a photographer, you were already doing that. I guess so. I think, I think he did bring something that really did catch the eye, didn't he? There's a sort of angst and tension right. in his work, which perhaps mine would not have had to the same degree. I think mine was more of a, an affectionate celebration of what I saw around me. I think his was possibly more hard-hitting. I guess you sort of come together, in a sense, with Bill Jay's album as well, and because Bill Jay had a lot of influence with Tony Ray Jones. Did you manage to be influenced by Tony Ray Jones in any way with his approach? No, no, I don't think so. I, I, in fact, I'm trying to think of if, if any of my contemporaries influenced me. I would say someone like Ian Berry would be more of an influence uh, yeah. in that I would quite often yearn to take pictures that had his sense of composition and so on that uh, perhaps I didn't. Tony Ray Jones I admired, but I didn't feel an affection about his work in the way that I do say about Ian Berry's which mm. I think is you know, so infused with humanity and warmth, you know, and a, a sense of really connecting with the human condition to a greater extent, I think. The whole thing about documentary photography is that there's so much of the photographer's ego, I think, can creep in. I guess that I admire most of the people who are in love with what's in front of them rather than perhaps a little bit more in love with themselves. Yeah harsh judgment to make but uh, i'm sure yeah. you get a sense of what i mean hindsight's a powerful tool isn't it because we can look back now and see 
how certain photographers work influenced the process and the development of photography. At the time, it's very different, isn't it? It's a smaller world, isn't it, around your photography? I, I think also at and... the time, you're too busy pressing on. You know, you're, exactly. you really are in love with what you're seeing through the viewfinder and not sort of seeing yourself in some historical context. I think that's something you can have the luxury of later on, perhaps. I think when you're young, the ambition and a drive for your own recognition and also wanting to find the moments that mean the most to you, that's what it's going to be about at that stage. What are you up to these days? Well, I've spent the last 18 months getting my archive into Popper Photo, which is run by a very nice guy, Bob yeah. Thomas, and he sells pictures through Getty. So what he offered me was the chance to, I mean, I think so far he's uploaded something like 5,000 images into Getty, and I think there's another 10,000 to go, perhaps, which is kind of quite good for me in that these pictures will have a life on into the future. And I think probably, you know, while pictures are being sold, <laughs> probably Getty will always be there. So to that extent, I feel that that's been a very worthwhile use of my time, which happened, in fact, to coincide very much with COVID, when the kind of pictures I like to shoot were not really, that kind of work really wasn't available to me. In that I mean, with people's faces hidden behind masks, then looking for candid moments where, you know, mirth and jollity are in abundance just wasn't happening. Yeah. But so that's that's the last 18 months. And then before that, I, I've been shooting a project called London as Diary, which was very much photographing back on the streets again, people celebrating all the things that one can do and enjoy in London. Yeah. So You've that's had... a very sort of a quick resume of the last five or six years, I guess. You had the wonderful job of keywording all your images, well, Gay. <coughs> well, funnily enough, with the Popper Photo, they have a guy who is their sort of wizard at keywording. So although I provided captions for my work and uh, to some extent had keyworded them, I think the, the major task of keywording in a, a way that would actually make sense for Getty, you know, has been yeah. done by Gary at, at Popper Photo. Yeah. It's a very difficult thing to do keywording in a very sort of brain-numbing experience, especially when you've got Yeah, it's not thousands. something I'd like to spend too much time on, I must admit. And especially as I think it's become such a skill that it's probably a professional keywording chap will do a better job than I could, even though they're my pictures. I think yeah, I can provide the background information, but certainly from a pure business of selling pictures, I think probably someone who knows the insides out of keywording is, is a better choice than perhaps the photographer himself or herself. I've always thought about the phrase, every picture has <laughs> a thousand words, which never really worked when I keyworded. <laughs> No, exactly. <laughs> Although um, no doubt one could find a thousand keywords, but uh, that's not the same as hopefully the picture still says something that keywords will never say. Yeah. <laughs> Take me back to when it all started from you. You were born in 1937. Where were you brought up? Take me, to, take me through your journey a little bit, right through to your archive editing. I think the real starting point for uh, as far as photography goes was my being just old enough to be in the last group of men I would, <laughs> boys actually who were called up to do national service so in 1955 when I was 18 yeah. I was called up and uh, became gunner ward for two years and what was good about that was that I'd led a, a somewhat, I was an only child, I'd led a somewhat sort of sheltered life up until that point. And uh, going into the army really threw me into, the, into a much sort of wider group of people. And that coincided with my becoming interested in photography. And while I was in the army, my girlfriend, who is still a great friend, but my girlfriend of uh, all those years ago, with great wisdom, sent me a book called The Family of Man, which right. uh, was a kind of pretty defining moment in a way. Come across a book of pictures that showed just how brilliantly the camera could be used to document the way people live, 
And you will know that the book yep. basically covers life from birth to death with, with all of the great moments in between. I was completely knocked out by this book and uh, there and then decided that I'd like to be a photographer. And, and also, while I was in the army, I found that the only, only way I could get out of camp was by <laughs> joining a course of some sort. So getting this book and then joining an evening photography course in Salisbury for one night a week, which was, I mean, it was completely useless. It was basically a group of middle-aged men who wanted to photograph young girls. Mm. Uh, so it wasn't exactly a deep, meaningful documentary photography. But at least I began to pick up cameras and get a sense of what... I don't know, pretty early on, I kind of was fairly sure the route I wanted to take. So on leaving the army, I went to the Regent Street Polytechnic for a couple of years. I mean, in retrospect, I don't think it was the right course to go on. They wanted to turn out sort of generalist photographers who could do a fashion shoot one day and a you know, dental photograph the next. And I don't think they... Fortunately, there was one guy who came in a day a week who lent me a Rolleiflex and said, go out and shoot some pictures. You know. So there was a combination of things going on that at least kept me knowing the direction I wanted to take, which was to go out and photograph people doing things. Had you bought a camera by this point? No, I think... Do you know, that, that's all getting a bit blurred now. That, that's the only problem about having been snapping for 60-odd years. The beginnings are getting a little bit frayed at the edges. But I, I kind of seem to think that within the first couple of years after that I must have got my first Leica. In a sense, that was like, gave a sense of joining the Great Brotherhood, you know, of people who used a camera to record life rock came through pretty early on that was what I wanted to do that these were the sort of cameras you needed to have the Regent Street Polytechnic coming back to that for a moment in a way I felt I probably tr was treading water for two years after being in the army and I was fairly fortunate and I'm trying to remember the guy's name there was a, a an Australian who ran a photography magazine who I had to see and he said you should go and see John Chillingworth right and John Chillingworth, who was the last man in the world who needed an assistant, took me on as his assistant. I think I was just fortunate in that he took a liking to me and maybe took pity on me. And so he took me under his wing. And although nominally I was his assistant in, in practice, within a very short time I was out, you know, getting assignments. And he was happy for that he was very generous. He himself was, uh, at this stage, he had been one of the, I think, the youngest photographer on Picture Post. And he'd been there in its last year or so. But by the time I joined him, Picture Post had gone. He, he was freelancing. He had a, an office in, in Fetter Lane off Fleet Street. He was largely working for uh, corporate magazines. People like the Coal Board and uh, Unilever and so on, uh, at that point, often had really rather good magazines. And well, he was shooting a lot for them. There must have been a massive learning curve for you being introduced to John Chillingworth. Was that after 50, about 57, 58, was it? Well, I would have been, by the time I got to John, I was 20 when I left the army. I was 22 when I left Reason Street Poly. So I was with him from the age of 22 to 24. Yeah. John Chillingworth was a prolific essayist. He was picture post photographer. I mean, he was very prolific, wasn't he? You couldn't have asked for a better person to be the assistant to at the time for what you wanted to do, I guess, because he was incredible. He was, and yet I don't really recollect to, that ex to any real extent assisting him. I mean, if ever a photographer didn't need an assistant, I mean, rather like Ian Berry, you know, yeah. he, was, he was very much a fly on the wall photographer. So my being in the background would have probably been a, a distraction and an annoyance. <laughs> so I, I struggle in a way to re recollect how I did assist him, except that I think he liked having a little team of people around him. <laughs> I mean, he had a full-time accountant, for example, yeah. who just sat in another room doing his books, which when, you, when I think that I see an accountant for half an hour each year, I, I've never quite worked out how... He structured his working life. But as I say, he was very good to me. He was very generous. He 
encouraged me. I began getting assignments from the Observer newspaper yeah. and also from Queen magazine, which was very fortuitous because the art editor of Queen magazine, a man called Mark Boxer, became the first editor of the Sunday Times magazine. Yeah. So when I went freelance, age 24, I began working for the Sunday Times magazine. So I was very blessed and very lucky. I mean, I think, you know, timing is everything sometimes. And when I think of a, a young photographer starting out today, I think they'd be very lucky to have the various introductions and openings that just seem to fall open in front of me. Yeah. What was your portfolio of work like then, to sort of get work with the Observer and the Sunday Times and magazines like that? What did you have in it? I think I probably had about a dozen tear sheets at that point. I mean, it does sound ridiculous. It, it, at that stage, I was getting work by word of mouth. If I did a job well, then I got another job. So I think I didn't begin to think about putting a portfolio together probably for several years after that. That's really interesting you're saying that because that's how my working life evolved. Word of mouth, right. you do a job, you go to a job as the Guardian photographer or Sunday Times photographer, and they go, you're a Guardian and Sunday Times photographer, would you like to come and photograph our thing? And it yeah. works like that, doesn't it? it it's a really interesting. And I think, have we lost that these days? That well, I think certainly success breeds success. I think we have lost it in that the openings just aren't there anymore. At least I wouldn't think they are. It could be that people do it, uh, take a different route now. You know, they mm. go uh, and build up blogs or do things on the internet and build up a following in that way. Yeah, I think people think, definitely meet each other less these days. Yeah, yeah, yes. It, I mean, that was another really nice thing. In my 20s, I had a group of real friends. I mean, David Hearn, Ian Berry, Philip Jones Griffiths, Don McCullen. So one was surrounded by people who were very fired up and, and yeah. were doing great work. And th that was a, a terrific incentive to pull one's own finger out and, and get out there and shoot, you know, because you had colleagues who were doing, doing likewise. Really of course, they were all getting published and getting assignments. I think that's really important, having your peers around you who are influencing you. I've spoken to photographers in the past who always thought other photographers were a threat to them in their work and their livelihood. I've always been the opposite. I've always loved having other photographers around, even if they're doing the same things as me, because it inspired me. I learned from them. It yeah. gave me that sort of understanding and that level I had to work at. Even now, some of the friends of mine who are amazing photographers, I use them for inspiration and their friendship. I think it's important. In the 60s, you had your likers. You started going out and documenting Britain. What was the urge to document daily life, the people of Britain? Well, I think to some extent it was coming back to the friendships I had. These were all photographers who were doing pretty important and serious work. I mean, Philip was doing Vietnam Incorporated. Don was shooting these major war stories for the Sunday Times magazine. Ian, you know, was under contract with The Observer, doing lots of powerful stuff. And I think I got a sense that none of what they were doing was kind of quite me. Mm. Uh, I felt there was kind of room for a court jester somewhere. Someone who would not have a sort of political message to give, not wanting to save the world, not wanting to, you know, I mean, Philip, for example, was incredibly politically motivated when he did Vietnam Incorporated. Yeah. And I just knew that I didn't have that kind of deep feeling about that's what photography should be. So I had to find, in a way, what was it that I felt I could do. And I suppose what I felt I could do was take pictures that just gave pleasure. I just got great joy myself of finding you know, fleeting moments that people could identify with and smile at. I just felt there was room for a photographer who would do that. And coming back to Tony Ray Jones, for example, it seems to me that, I mean, it's interesting to think that if he and I went to the same event, we would have come back with very different pictures. And I think that is bred by the attitude of mind that we have to our subjects. I suppose I've uh, you know, I've never been that earnest about things. There was a time when I felt, well, 
does that mean that what I'm doing is trivial? And gradually I built the, the sense that no, it wasn't because, you know, there is room for what I, for what I want to do and what, pe and that people will enjoy it. Does that cool. make sense? I mean, although in the sixties I did have some pictures which have, you know, remained in the sort of public eye of miners and worked for shelter, for example, on the Gorbals in Scotland. I mean, these were very striking and powerful images of people leading very tough and underprivileged lives. Yeah. But I would say 90% of my work has been much more middle class, home counters, England, really. The English um, of play. Yeah. yeah. You know, and it's taken me in, up into the Yorkshire Dales and, and the Highlands and so on. But, but it's usually, it hasn't, with very, except for quite early work, which was usually commissioned, my own personal work, which is, I suppose, you know, if I put together a portfolio now, it would be 90% personal work. You know, that has been, to a large extent, middle-class England at play. Yeah. What film were you sure. using? Were you in Tri-X? Uh, yeah, I was uh, Tri-X, HP4. I mean, Bert Hardy's lab did all my processing for a large part of my working life. I was quite happy to delegate that. One of the joys of the last 20 odd years has been that I have, during that period starting around 2003, so nearly 20 years ago, I switched to digital. Mm. And it was only at that point that I could really claim that I became a fully rounded photographer in the sense that I went out and took the pictures, came back and processed them, made prints, designed a book, got it published. That's something I wouldn't have dreamt of early, earlier in life. So digital was a wonderful turning point for me and remains so. Seems to be as well, because you self-published a lot as well, didn't you? And I think the digital age really sort of helps us in ways in terms of output. It was a lot cheaper. I mean, the cameras were quite expensive, but in terms of your working methods, digital was a lot cheaper. I don't think people realise the process and the expense involved with black and white and or, or negative i should say or e6 or whatever it was a massive sometimes the laborious process wasn't it i think yeah digital opened up our world and i, and I know you still publish a lot of books and we'll look at that later and one project which has always fascinated me even before i knew you were part of it was man plan i think architectural review that sort of period in 69 and that series of images, projects they did in the review, I thought was amazing. And this is in hindsight, you know, I'm, I'm probably 30 years before I realised it was happening and I can't get a copy of it. It's like really expensive, actually, to get a copy of the original Architectural Review Man Plan series. It certainly is. It's a real, a real struggle. No, well... Architectural Review took on a guest editor called Tim Rock. Yeah, um, well, let's it? just go back, actually, because I, what I want to do is, what was Man Plan? Just talk about what Man Plan was and how you got involved, and then we'll talk about some of your pictures. Right, well, as far as I knew, Architectural Review was a magazine that published nice, sharp pictures of buildings where all the verticals yeah. were vertical, which basically meant they were probably shot with plate cameras with rising backs and all the paraphernalia you need to represent architecture faithfully. And it was um, a bit of a purist, wasn't it? It was for people who really loved architecture. It yeah, was about uh, academics uh, as well. And, of course, all the advertising in the magazine was put in on the basis of, that it was that sort of magazine. Yeah. So along came this man called Tim Rock, who lived around the corner from me in Holland Park in 1969. And he was given carte blanche to produce, I think it was six or eight, six issues of the magazine, which would be about the, the state of life in Britain at that point. There seemed to be no reference to architecture at all. He rang me and said, would I come around and see him? And I, I kind of thought it was a mistake because I, you know, I'm not an architectural photographer. I don't wish to be an architectural photographer. And anyway, when I went to see him, he said, no, no, it's not about architecture. He said, I want you to do what you do. I want you to go around Britain and show the state of Britain. 
And I spent the next six weeks doing precisely that. And I can remember coming back to the office every sort of, you know, sort of five or six days and 50, 60 rolls of film, getting them processed by my lab, going in with the contact sheets, and there they were pouring over them. They were building the magazine almost day by day as I brought the material in. It was the most unusual and bizarre experience. I mean, I have, in some ways, have never done anything as intense before or since. It was a six-week, as I say, flat out, on the road, non-stop. And, of course, it built on itself. You know, you, you got into a, a frame of mind where I could walk around the corner without seeing, you know, a dark, somber image that would fit into man plan. So it, it, was, a, it was an amazing experience. It was an amazing experience for the subscribers of Architecture Review as well, wasn't it? Because I think it was an when, amazing one. But let's think about it. Many of them resented. <laughs> I, I, think, resented. I think it, well, it, it did a feature over six supplements within over a few months. There was six or seven different supplements, which was well, focused think, on different I photographers. What, I think what actually happened was I, I did the first one, which was, I think it was 74 pages. Wow. Which in itself, you know, with every other page, with every other spread was a double spread image sort of thing. It was deliberately printed in, to come out looking incredibly black and white and, and dark and moody. And I think the subsequent, it did seem to tail off. I think John Bulmer did one, Ian Berry did one. I think Tony Ray Jones was involved mm. in one. I think there was a loss of nerve as it proceeded. I think there was probably so much negative feedback from the readership and even more from the advertisers who, you know, said, what the hell, you know, th this isn't Architectural Review anymore. This is Life magazine or Reality or Picture Post, but it's certainly not Architectural Review. So and I think I think I was very lucky to shoot the first one with an almost open brief, whereas the subsequent issues were focused much more tightly on individual subject matter. I've never quite worked out why it was commissioned, but what happened <laughs> and what was the the result of it was some amazing images. I mean, it was a, it was incredible. Some of the the images which came out, and subsequently, two books illustrating your man plan was published by Cafe Royal Books about 2015 or something, wasn't it? That's right. And my favourite is Man Plan Two. Some of the images are just beautiful, and you really went into the heart of the communities, didn't you? Well, I, I did, but having said that, you know, the truth is that it, I'd say it was six weeks, but in a way it was only six weeks. And so many of my visits were so fleeting. I mean, I went to the Gorbals, for example, and I was actually there for about four hours with a minder. And out of that, you know, I have eight pictures, which are probably amongst the best pictures that I've shot. Yeah, so, but that makes a great photographer. That proves how good you are. That's what photography can be like in the working context. You do have fleeting visits, but it's what you get when you're there. Then you're tuned into what you need to get. If you were just saying you're a fleeting photographer, then that really says a lot about how good you were. Because them images, some of these images are just, I mean, fantastic. Two of my favourite shots. I'm not going to let you talk because I'm convincing you that you're really, really good. <laughs> <laughs> two shots out of the, the Man Plan 2 in Capricorn Books is how you composed the six miners together, or, or six guys in the working caps, flat caps and stuff like that. It, it's yeah. such a clever composition of shot, but I think shot of a row of men in a room with the natural daylight coming through the window, and they are sitting at a table, and they're, they're all queuing up the table. What's that about? That's beautiful. Do you know, I can't place that picture in my mind's eye at the moment. It's like a, a community centre or... I and think they were probably just going in to do their weekly signing on, signing on for... Right, you know, yeah. Powerful. So yeah. powerful. So go back and justify it now. <laughs> you were just fleeting it, but, you know, you were just... You mean justifying, justifying man plan? Yeah. I think man plan, it, it wasn't just about the photography. It was about, although you could say a 70-page 
feature has to be about the photography, but it was also about the the way the images were used. That the use of text was sparing but very powerful. The printing was incredibly black and white, which added another dimension. So it was, you know, pretty much a team effort, and I happened to be at the spearhead of it. Did you do much of your black and white printing then? No, I, in fact, oh, this is embarrassing. I don't think I started printing until I went digital. Seriously? Yeah, so <laughs> I managed wow. to work for 40 years. You know, Grove Hardy made my prints. I mean, I, I certainly reached a point where I could suggest to Jerry Groves, you know, how I would like a print to look. Yeah. But when I think of the printing I do now, I realize that with the best will in the world, I was another client and he was fond of me and he put effort into my prints. But I don't think anyone makes the print that you're as satisfied with as the print you make yourself. Yeah. So, in a way, my photography has had a, a new lease of life post-digital because it has encouraged me and, and given me the opportunity to be a, a full photographer rather than just going out and taking the pictures. I have a, I have a, a modern darkroom, which is with daylight flooding into it, where I pour the, the curtains. <laughs> in other words, my darkroom is my, my iMac screen. Absolutely. Of course it is. <laughs> Towards the end of the 60s, you started getting involved with Bill Jay's album, which was 12 magazines, photography yeah. magazines. How did that come about? Well, I think there was this, as I say, there was this coterie of photographers that I've mentioned previously. And we all used to meet up at David Hearn's flat and go out for supper together. And we were a real community. And of course, uh, Bill Jay hovered on the edge of that community, knew us all. So I think it became inevitable in a way that, you know, if one had a body of work that he liked, that, you know, he would publish it. So I was fortunate to, as I say, to be within that group that, that he was very much involved with. What was Bill Jay like? He's a, a strange guy. Somewhat later on, he, he became professor of history of photography at a university in Tempe in Arizona. Paid two visits to him there, one to photograph a group of Hells Angels, which he helped facilitate. And also a couple of years later, I went back on a grant, a bicentennial fellowship, and I went and stayed with him for a few days and bought a car in Arizona before setting off across America. So I spent quite a bit of time with him. I've never known anyone who was so intensely in love with photography and with a whole range of photography. And, and also, I, I'd add, it was no mean photographer himself. I mean, he's produced a series of portraits of yeah. photographers that he'd met over the years, which I think are absolutely terrific. But uh, he was incredibly driven, incredibly driven. I think probably... Uh, an, probably let nothing stand in his way, you know, when he was yeah. pursuing his interests. You know, he certainly left behind a, a, a very substantial body of work. This album is beautiful, the magazine. I remember seeing a photograph that he took of Tony Ray Jones in a pub in Shoreditch or somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. actually sitting in front of me, I have a copy of album 10, number 10, which has got your... It looks like Hyde Park or somewhere like that. You've got a picture of a young boy as a sort of knight of the round table, and that's the cover. And then you're, you've got, in flicking through it, you've got your work, which seemingly is a bit more about the English at play. And there's a lovely picture of you smiling with the camera there. Right, and, uh, right. But you God, are right. a useful picture. This, and this is quite a lot about the sort of middle class is what's in here as well, isn't it? Because you did pick up on that earlier. But this is the sort of the English at leisure, isn't it, in this edition? Yes, I think of that. What year is that? It is October 70, I think. Yeah. I was, at that point, really just getting into photographing the English at play, which eventually led to a book published by Gordon Fraser in 1977 called Wish You Were Here, The English yeah. at Play. And I think it's probably fair to say that that does have some of my best sort of 
personal black and white photos in it. The reproduction quality is wonderful on this. I mean, these pictures look amazing. It's weird that you have to turn your book round. So you have to turn album round to a sort of horizontal format to view your pictures. I love the cheek of that. I love the way it's making you do that. Right. That was the thing. I think we all wanted to be an album because it was such a wonderful showplace for our work. It is definitely. You've had quite a few Cafe Royal books published. You've had six, I think. You've had them. Miners, yes, I think two, five, five two man six. plans, the Dirty Dozen, the English Play, Bonfire Societies. I, is that in Lewis, is it, the Bonfire Societies? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I've been to one of them pagan nights many, many years ago by accident. Not to photograph, I just went with somebody who said, oh, yeah. you need to see this, and I didn't take my camera. Back well, I top. actually joined, I joined one of the societies for a couple of nights and dressed up in their uniform. So that I could sort of blend, really blend in. You were covert. Um, well, it was really helpful because when you're on the streets through the night, you know, and you have various sort of marshals and officials. If you're a photographer, they tend to push you away. Whereas if you're wearing the uniform of, in my case, the Waterloo Bonfire Society, then you're in, in the mix of it all, you know, and I just spent the whole time shooting with short lenses, you know, from yeah. close in, which was lovely. Did they know what you were doing, the, the group you joined? Uh, oh, yes. No, I, I approached them and asked them if I could. And, in fact, uh, they they invited me to to wear their kit and so on so that I could sort of blend in. In many ways, it's good because for, for the public audience, you know, a photographer is right in the middle of a situation is much less of an annoyance if, if he looks like he's yeah. one of them rather than... So, no, that was a really good arrangement. You continued documenting Britain in black and white, in predominantly black and white in the 70s. And into the 80s, you crossed over and went to America. And I know you just said you went over to live with Bill Jay. And I think, was that when you did the Dirty Dozen? No, I'd, I'd gone over previously in 1979. I photographed a book about biking, and uh, which had about eight or ten essays in it on various aspects of motorcycling. And I thought it wouldn't be complete without an essay on, you know, an American biker gang. Hell's Angels. And I, was, I think I must have spoken to Bill about this. And he said, well, we've got a girl, one of my students, and her boyfriend is the president of the Dirty Dozen, which is, was a motorcycle gang based around Phoenix, Arizona. And I can remember I gave, I think I went over for a week or so and gave some tutorials for his students and one afternoon I gave them a slideshow and there were a dozen you know 20 year olds sitting at the front of the hall and in the back were these three rather dangerous looking characters in leathers who were from the Dirty Dozen and we'd invited them to come and see this slideshow which actually contained like the first half of my biking book. Did Bill just invite them down? Well, no, we spoke to his the student who was a girlfriend ah, of them. Right. She approached them and said, would they come and see the show? Right. Because we've got this English photographer who'd like to photograph you. And they came, one of them was on crutches, I seem to remember, having fallen off his bike. And they watched the show. And then afterwards, I went up and saw them and said, what do you think? Would you let me come and photograph you and they said yeah join us next weekend <laughs> which is what i did it's just a weekend riding pillion with the president and photographing oh, what they were yeah. up to it's amazing I mean, i've it done was... that i've done that in a harley davidson and, and right. it's amazing isn't it well they do vibrate a lot so that's amazing <laughs> yeah, that's for sure i was lucky in a way because they certainly looked the part and yet they were kind of i would call them hell's angels light by which oh, yeah. I mean they, they were not the real heavies who, who I might have got myself into trouble with. Yeah. And they made me welcome. And I have to say, I kept my face buried behind my camera more or less throughout the weekend, you know, so that as far as they were concerned, you know, I hadn't come there to enjoy myself or pretend to be a house angel. I was there purely to record what they were doing. And I think they accepted and, and respected that. I think there Did are times like as, a, as a photographer where you, you have to be really self-effacing, you know. You can chat about it and brag about it afterwards, but while you're with a group like this, you know, 
you have to put all of your energies in. You know, if you don't come away with with lots of film, then you haven't done anything. You know? No pressure then. <laughs> well, as I say, fortunately at that point, you 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 probably reached a, a stage in your life where a lot of what you do is on an instinctive level. Yeah. Um, so you know your mind remains clear. You know you're looking for those fleeting moments that sum up what you what you're enjoying and what you're seeing. So yeah, there there is pressure, but on the other hand, there's also a terrific sense of fulfilment. Mm. So it's an interesting trade-off that between the you know and also you see in that particular situation, I had a book that was fifty percent finished, maybe more. And I just realized, you know, from word, the word go, the moment I got behind the president on his Harley, that this was the set of pictures I really needed. And I had to do them, yeah. you know, to the best of my ability. Did they like the pictures? Very much, yes. And in fact, uh, they've been in touch with me over the years since. I had a, wow. a woman wrote to me a few years back and said that her son had come across, had seen the pictures and did I know where she could, could get a, a print? And in fact, I sent her some prints. But also heard sad things like a year or so later, the, the Dirty Dozen were drawn into the Hells Angels and became a much more serious and dangerous group of people. And quite mm. a lot of them died, either you know getting shot or murdered. I think I was blessed in that when I visited them, they were... A, a, a rather more relaxed, friendly group. Later on, they tra they did turn into something rather more dangerous and ugly. The works published by Cafe Royal Books 2015. Again, I wonder, looking back now, them seeing that, you know, because there will be sort of, a lot of them be retired gentlemen now, probably. It'd be interesting how they looked at this period in 2016, 2017, when they received that. Absolutely. You know, Anybody been in touch about it at all? I, I've had the, I had, I have had a couple of messages. I mean, I, I would have been 42 when I shot the pictures. Yeah. And I would think that some of the riders were of my age, but most of them were younger. So that would suggest that most of them now would be in their 60s and 70s. Mm. I suspect that this was always going to be a phase in their life from which they would eventually move on. Yeah. You know, family, children, all mortgages, even catch up with Hell's Angels. It's great memories, and they've, they've got a nice documentation of a part of their lives, or probably in some cases, maybe still their lives. Staying in America, I'm quite interested in this. You shot a lot of Americans at play, at Americans' leisure in the 80s, in black and white. But I was noticing in the 80s in England, you were shooting colour, or you were shooting a lot more colour. You stayed in with black and white for the American stuff. Yeah, it seemed to me that, I, I think at that point, I still strongly believed that black and white was what photography was really about, and that colour was for assignments, really. Yeah. And for, for colour magazines and so on. I, I tend not to think that now, but uh, certainly back then, I think in a way, the, the American project w was my swan song for black and white photography. Because thereafter, I think I began to feel that, uh, that I wanted to shoot everything in, in colour. Ironically, I, I now tend to go through do things I've shot in colour and, and find that some of those images make very good black and white pictures. <laughs> in fact, look stronger in black and white than they, than they did in colour. So, yeah. Whether that means that I, I'm still basically a black and white photographer who shoots colour film or colour colour files um, yeah. is an interesting point in itself. Yeah. I wondered I, if your commercial side had an influence on staying in colour in the UK. Because I remember when black and white in editorial and that side of commissioned work became a little bit en vogue and colour was the sort of, they wanted, people wanted colour and we wanted to see colour portfolios as well. And I just wondered if that had something to do with that transition period of the 80s and the 90s where it was sort of... Yeah, I, 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 sort of I, off a bit. I can't say I was conscious of some outside force pushing me towards colour. Um, yeah. I was working 
for the Sunday Times magazine. Then I was working with uh, the Telegraph magazine for quite a long time in the 70s and 80s. And for American magazines and German and French Geo. Now, all of, all of these magazines publish color pictures. Mm. So I shot in color. But when I think about it, when I go out and shoot now, I really don't think about it that much. I think that I'm thinking about what I'm shooting, and I happen to be shooting color, color material. But one of the joys of digital is is that at a later date, you have that ability to make very good quality black and white as well from the images which you initially shot in color. Yeah, I don't think I've ever been a photographer who was bewitched. I was probably believed more in black and white than I ever got to believe in color, if you see what I mean. It does. I think it's interesting. I think if you go back, and we were talking about Ian Berry before, he loved black and white. He used color negative. He loved color negative because it gave him an option to use it as black and white. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And to use it as color. And that's what he did. And we did, I remember him shooting his water projects in China and, and stuff like that. And that was his attitude. But he, he didn't like digital at first because I remember him saying to me, oh, you can never delete an egg. <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, it's quite an interesting concept. But like somebody like Philip George Griffiths, I don't think Philip was ever comfortable shooting color, even working with him in color. I don't think he ever really liked working in color. He was definitely a black and white man through and through. And I think Philip struggled with colour a lot. And I may be wrong, but that was just my personal experience with him. Because his commercial work, he had to shoot colour. And I just never thought he really enjoyed it. No, except that I think Philip was always, always up for a technical challenge. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and and to think... that extent, you know, if it, if it was in some way breaking new ground and colour film came out that was a thousand ASA, he'd be at the front of the queue to try it and to, and to find subject matter that worked with it. So, no, I, in fact, I would argue that Ian far more is the photographer who, at heart, is, is a pure black and white photographer mm. and would happily not shoot colour ever again if, if he could go on shooting and selling. Yeah black and white pictures yeah as, as i say for myself it's never really been an issue i'm really much more interested in the content of the picture rather than yeah, whether it's course. color black and white of course and obviously if one can reach a you know a bigger audience with with color i, I suspect that that would tempt me to go down that route yeah you had a retrospective work being english published in 2014 i think yeah how did that come about I'm trying to remember. I think I, I just sent a dummy off to Colin, Colin Wilkinson, and it, it was actually a more general coverage, but he, he said, why don't you narrow it down to, to the English, which I was happy to do. And I think if you recollect that, it runs in chronological order, and it is black and white for the first half and colour for the second. Yeah. Did you send him a blurb dummy? Yes, I think I made a, a dummy, and then I refined it several times. Yeah. Uh, I think he said, well, I'll just run it past my designer. And I said, no, no, don't let's do that. This is the book I want it to be. And that was great about Colin. I mean, I've done a, a second book with him on the Thames. Yeah. And both of them, for better or for worse, he was prepared to stick with my design. I say my design, that's a bit of a grand word for... The fact that I put pictures as big as I can on a page. Yeah. That's my my design philosophy is that photographs should be big and bold. I, I yeah. don't get enchanted very much by big white spaces around pictures that, that scream art. Yeah, it's negotiating that the gutter, isn't it, in terms of having that's a double page that, that, That's a challenge. But again, I think uh, I'm surprised how often designers are very rigid. And they work out a, a design grid, and the pictures are then expected to fit the design. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas I, when I put a picture across the spread, I'm prepared to move it to the left or to the right so that I don't lose the important part of the picture in the, in the gutter. So that yeah. means that uh, my design grid is not as formal as I think most designers would prefer it to be. But I think yeah. it does tend to respect each photograph as you come to it. Yeah. You're part of permanent collections. What did you do with the Arts Council? Was it a funded exhibition program or a book? No, I think I think with the Arts Council, they've merely bought in pictures from time to time. 
Uh, yeah. It's really strange. I mean, I've got a couple of pictures in the V&A, for example, but they got them because they were part of a collection by a, a magazine editor. Yeah. Which I found somewhat surprising that they hadn't even approached me, you know. I don't think well, I am that represented in collections, actually. Yeah. I did have a little chuckle to myself when I saw that you were part of the Royal Institute of British Architecture's collection. I'm thinking about the controversy and the whole type of imagery. I thought, wow, they, they succumb and put it into the archive. Because it was a major thing, that. It was a really interesting part of their history, wasn't it? And I was happy when I saw that, I was saying. Yes. Um, I, in fact, I think, sadly, they've actually taken me out of their archive now. Really? Well, I had an issue that they were offering prints for sale. And that rather clashed. It became a bit of an issue. I wasn't keen on it, and particularly as the, whatever prints they were offering were obviously made from copying prints that they had got when the magazine was published, because yeah. they'd never had a, a print from me, and yet they were offering pictures for commercial use, and I've never allowed my pictures to be used except for editorial use. So that created a bit of a stink, which was heightened by my relationship with Popper Photo. And right. in fact, I said, look, I'm happy for you to have the pictures in the collection, but I'm not happy for them to be for sale in any way. Yeah. And the last I heard was that they had removed them from the collection because their computer system didn't allow them not to offer them for sale or something wow. ludicrous. Wow. Um, which is rather a shame because I'm not at all averse for them being there for students and people to see. Mm. But th they were actually offering them, you know, commercially for sale. I'm sure they could, was illegal in that they, they were not model released in any way. Yeah. And I have never asked anyone to sign a model release. I mean, I just would never ask someone to let one of my pictures sell cigarettes or things that I might not know about or approve of. I definitely man planned is on my bucket list to find and buy. It's one of them yeah they must be out there somewhere and last it I is it I is heard, yeah it is i'm hoping to find it in a charity shop one day or yeah, yeah. an oxfam bookshop one day because the cost the to... prices have been asked are ridiculous yeah yeah i think martin Parr might be one of the last buyers who maybe forced the prices up well martin's got everything yeah. over there he's got everything <laughs> yeah 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 which is good which is good he's doing great things over there at the um, Martin Park Foundation. What are you working on? Have you got any exhibitions lined up? What are little projects you're working on? What's what's the next step? It's, it's, it's really trying to get the Londoner's Diary published. Blue Coat Press published my previous two books, and I would have loved them to have published the Londoner's Diary, yeah. which is a, a book of the same size and format as being English, and I think would have made a wonderful companion piece. But sadly, the publisher is retiring, and the future of, of that publisher is uncertain. So I'm out there kind of searching. I'm still actually shooting pictures for that. I don't think Blue Court's going to end, and that's all I can say on the matter for now. Mm. I think it will continue. There's other people like Dewey, Lewis. There's the crowdsourcing connection and doing it. I think there's options and ways of doing it. I think there's Blue Court will continue, and... I think it's great that you're doing it, and I think it's great that you've still got the vision and the drive to get out and create and, and work at it, and, and I, I commend you on that. And I think it's very easy to sort of sit back, especially when you put a lot into the industry, and I think you've got a lot out of it mentally as well and obviously physically. Have you ever thought of mentoring and putting stuff back into the youth, the grassroots level of the industry? No, I think it sounds silly for an 85-year-old to say this, but I, I still really feel that I'm a young lad who ought to be out there shooting, and that mentoring is for the, for the old guys. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I get much more of an adrenaline rush anticipating seeing a great moment unfolding in front of me than I could by mentoring. I mean, I've done the occasional... Uh, talk and things of that sort, but uh, I I'm really still want to be out there shooting. I think mentoring to me would be accepting that it was time to retire, and I'm nowhere <laughs> near that point yet. <laughs> Excellent. Patrick, it's been wonderful. I'm really pleased that I've had time to have a chat with you and just find out about where you've connected 
with the world and do well, photography. Me too. In the I, I've enjoyed it. It's been a pleasure, and thank you for your time, Patrick. And I wish you well, and many, many picture frames ahead of you uh, in right. your camera, which will cross your path. Thank you. Right, I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. Pleasure. All the best. Take care. Bye bye.